So I'd like to go back a little bit to the idea of the two liberations and then come back to the Sapta Chatustya tomorrow. Um, but most of the cantos are, that we're concerned with have to do with exactly this negation and affirmation, mo the movement of negation and the movement of affirmation. Yes. So in the synthesis of yoga, Sri Aurobindo writes, the seeker of liberation. Now we're not talking about bringing down the supermind here. <laughs> in, it, in fact, Sri Aurobindo tells us in Savitri that it can't be done, even by him. And so when he's told that, he, he um, petitions the, the mother who is in him at that moment to send a ray of herself to help the process of yoga. This is Savitri. But the idea of, of the supermind is a descent which comes when the earth is ready for it. So this is not our business. So what is the descent of the supermental that happened on that day? That's the mother. She knows about that. But even at the end of her life, she was saying that the consciousness that was manifesting was not that. It was the possibility of the superman, the highest possibilities of the human, which are the transitional beings and there's still no question of the supermind descending. So, so that's not our business. But the seeker of liberation, you know, in the footnote, it's Sri Aurobindo says there's still plenty to do. And even he couldn't convince the universe to bring down the supermind because he was told it would destroy everything. This is an evolutionary problem. But the spiritual problem is uh, the two, to achieve the two liberations. So, the seeker of liberation gets rid of attachment. This is the Siddhi of Samatha, Shanti, Sukham, Hasyam. Throws away from his soul the dualities. No more liking and disliking and pleasure and pain. But as the dualities appear to be the whole act, stuff and frame of life, this release would seem to be more easily compassed by a withdrawal from life. And in fact, that's true. Whether a physical withdrawal so far as that is possible while in the body, or an inner retirement, a refusal of sanction, a liberating distaste, vairagya, for the whole action of nature. And this is precisely what Patanjali recommends. Vairagya. The, the rejection of every kind of involvement with nature. There is a separation of the soul from nature, purusha from prakriti. Then the soul watches, seated above and unmoved, 
Udasina, the strife of the gunas in the natural being, and regards as an impassive witness the pleasure and pain of the mind and body. So what we're going to hear in Savitri next is precisely that realization. But you may recall that Sri Aurobindo says in uh, somebody have Sapta Tatustia here? I left mine in the house. Yeah. That's it. Um, he's oh no that's not it. Shanti may be either a vast passive calm based on Uddhas, Sinata, or a vast joyous calm based on Nati. The former is apt to associate itself with a tendency to inaction, and it is therefore in the latter that our yoga must culminate. So the Samatha is both the Uddha, Sinata, and the Nati. And the nati is the recognition of the divine in everything which comes about as a result of rejection of attachment. So, in this part of the synthesis of yoga, he is actually speaking about vairagya. He says, this rejection is not the last possible word of liberation. The integral per liberation comes when this passion for release, founded on distaste or vairagya, is itself transcended. The soul is then liberated both from attachment to the lower action of nature and from all repugnance to the cosmic action of the divine. So this is the first liberation still, but it is twofold. Liberation from attachment to everything and at the same time realization of the divine in everything. Then, this liberation gets its completeness when the spiritual gnosis Vijnana can act with a supramental knowledge and reception of the action of nature and a supramental luminous will in initiation. Then that will in initiation is the universal rhythm, the will in all acting through the individual. Yeah. This liberation gets its completeness when the spiritual gnosis, the spiritual gnosis, that is the transcendental identity with things that happen from the point of view of their inner essence. That's the spiritual gnosis. The supermind still hasn't descended and transformed the world and all of that. This is still the process of ascent. And all of Savitri is about the process of ascent. 
So, the descent is something else. The Gnosis discovers the spiritual sense in nature. God in things. The soul of good in all things that have the contrary appearance. So we had this whole day of learning about the soul in things. It is not what they appear to be externally. It is something vast and to be worked out in order for things to become what they potentially can become. That's the soul. What they are now is a temporal finite expression of that which is infinite. So we need to be able to see both aspects of a reality. The temporal expression which is changing all the time and the soul behind which is unchanging and infinitely powerful to realize unrealized qualities. So this changes the, the valence, this kind of seeing, the valence, the positive or negative valence, it changes that. That soul is delivered in them and out of them. So this is a transformation of consciousness. This is not the supramental descent. The perversion of the imperfect or contrary forms fall away or are transformed into their higher divine truth, even as the gunas go back to their divine principles. And the spirit lives in a universal, infinite, and absolute truth, good, beauty, bliss, which is the ideal divine nature. But the outer appearances of things don't change. So, what the mother was pointing out in the earlier passage today was that in order to achieve that there is this tendency to see the one and only the one and to negate all the temporal forms and appearances and qualities and that tendency has become many, many schools of yoga that teach exactly that. And in Savitri, Sri Aurobindo expresses this realization frequently. And it's necessary as a passageway to realizing in the multiplicity the divine gunas, the gunas, the, the tamasic and rajasic and sattvic gunas through which everything is constantly vacillating are replaced in one's consciousness by the trigunya titya, the perfect calm, not tamas, the perfect energy, not rajas, and the perfect sattva, not just equality and balance, but the true seeing and being that is possible in the body, in the mind, in the vital when they are transformed. 
So this he calls, this, this movement of the gunas back to their divine origins, is not something that's happening in nature, it's something that's happening in the self. And so that self understands that the fluctuations of the gunas are, originate in that divine trigunya titya. And calm is always there, and energy is always there, and balance is always there in the self, not in the forms of nature. Because this nature gets sufficiently transformed to hold that view. So this is the story of yoga. The liberation of the nature becomes one with the liberation of the spirit and there is founded in the integral freedom, the integral perfection. And elsewhere in the synthesis he says, a liberation from nature in a quiescent bliss of the spirit is the first form of release. A farther liberation of the nature into divine quality and spiritual power of world experience, not of world, of world experience, fills the supreme calm with the supreme kinetic bliss of knowledge, power, joy, and mastery. A divine unity of supreme spirit and its supreme nature is the integral perfection. Then there becomes possible a descent of the supramental Maha Shakti itself into the transformed human consciousness. But even Sri Aurobindo and the mother didn't achieve that. They were working towards that and creating a path towards that. And that is a new species. It's not the human being that can do that. But there is apparently a transitional species or a subspecies that is so transformed in consciousness that it becomes a, an instrument, a vehicle for that descent. I think that that's a pretty fine line to draw. The second liberation seems to be um, within the range of the human being. But to be that superman, that um, overman as uh, uh, Van, Van Recken calls it, Um, seems to me to indicate a human being who is um, sufficiently transparent to the supramental that that energy field can be a, a kind of permanent experience on the even on the physical plane. You know, the mother was really shooting for that the human being becoming an instrument of that force. But she said it only could stay with her for a few hours and some cells of the body responded and 
So apparently there, there will be or there could be a transitional um, higher type of human before the supramental species is possible. And in and that one they speak of as being something that doesn't even eat food and reproduce and can change its form at will and things like that. The, the, the divine perfection in a material form. But they say that even then, the, the, even then matter will be of a different quality than this matter that we are made of. So when we are reading these cantos of uh, like, like the two that are coming up and, and, and two in, the, in book seven, I think what we're hearing is the, a, a description of the two liberations that are being spoken of here. And the second one entails a descent of the divine Shakti, but in consciousness, you know, which means mainly in the higher mind and to some extent the vital, but it's, um, in Sri Aurobindo describes the physical as being something that's touched by it, but it doesn't really change very much. It can be passively receptive to it, but it doesn't change the way the physical is structured. So we're, we're, we're hearing about a, a transformation from the mental into the over-mental and supramental regions of experience. After that becomes stabilized, then that energy can descend into the Adara and transform it. This is the long road. <laughs> Some have to achieve that transformation of consciousness. That's what we're talking about. It is the first canto of book three. And here we go. And there's almost an identical canto in book seven. And in both books, this canto gets repeated a little bit in the following canto. And so we'll hear that. We'll hear these transitions. They're also similar to the one we just heard between 13 and 14 in book two. So these are the cantos that I consider to be most instructive with respect to yoga siddhi. All is too little that the world can give. Its power and knowledge are the gifts of time and cannot fill the spirit's sacred thirst. Although of one these forms of greatness are, and by its breath of grace our lives abide, although more near to us than nearness's self, it is some utter truth of what we are, hidden by its own work. It seemed far off, impenetrable, 
<coughs> occult, voiceless, obscure. The presence was lost by which all things have charm. The glory lacked of which they are dim signs. The world lived on, made empty of its cause. like love when the beloved's face is gone. The labor to know seemed a vain strife of mind. All knowledge ended in the unknowable. The effort to rule seemed a vain pride of will. A trivial achievement, scorned by time. All power retired into the omnipotent. A cave of darkness guards the eternal light. A silence settled on his striving heart. Absolved from the voices of the world's desire, he turned to the ineffable's timeless call. A being intimate and unnameable, a wide, compelling ecstasy and peace, felt in himself and all, and yet ungrasped, approached and faded from his soul's pursuit, as if forever luring him beyond. Near it retreated, far it called him still. Nothing could satisfy but its delight. Its absence left the greatest actions dull. Its presence made the smallest seem divine. When it was there, the heart's abyss was filled. But when the uplifting deity withdrew, existence lost its aim in the inane. The order of the immemorial planes, the godlike fullness of the instruments, were turned to props for an impermanent scene. But who that mightiness was, he knew not yet. Impalpable, yet filling all that is, it made and blotted out a million worlds and took and lost a thousand shapes and names. It wore the guise of an indiscernible vast, or was a subtle kernel in the soul. A distant greatness left it huge and dim, a mystic closeness shut it sweetly in. It seemed sometimes a figment or a robe, and seemed sometimes 
his own colossal shade. A giant doubt overshadowed his advance. Across a neutral, all-supporting void whose blankness nursed his lone, immortal spirit. Allured towards some recondite supreme, aided, coerced by enigmatic powers, aspiring and half-sinking and upborn, invincibly he ascended without pause. Always a signless, vague immensity brooded without approach, beyond response, condemning finite things to nothingness, fronting him with the incommensurable, Then, to the ascent, there came a mighty term. A height was reached where nothing made could live. A line where every hope and search must cease. A line where every hope and search must cease neared some intolerant, bare reality. A zero formed, pregnant with boundless change. on a dizzy verge where all disguises fail. And human mind must abdicate in light or die like a moth in the naked blaze of truth. He stood compelled to a tremendous choice. All he had been, and all towards which he grew, must now be left behind. Or else, transform into a self of that which has no name. Alone and fronting an intangible force which offered nothing to the grasp of thought, his spirit faced the adventure of the inane, abandoned by the worlds of form, he strove. A fruitful worldwide ignorance foundered here. Thought's long, far-circling journey 
touched its clothes. And ineffective paused the actor will. The symbol modes of being helped no more. The structures nescience builds collapsing failed. And even the spirit that holds the universe fainted in luminous insufficiency. in an abysmal lapse of all things built. Transcending every perishable support and joining at last its mighty origin, the separate self must melt or be reborn into a truth beyond the mind's appeal. All glory of outline, sweetness of harmony, rejected like a grace of trivial notes, expunged from being's silence, nude, austere, died into a fine and blissful nothingness. The demiurges lost their names and forms. The great schemed worlds that they had planned and wrought passed, taken and abolished, one by one. The universe removed its colored veil. And at the unimaginable end of the huge riddle of created things appeared the far-seen Godhead of the whole. His feet firm-based on life's stupendous wings. Omnipotent, a lonely seer of time, Inward, inscrutable, with diamond gaze. Attracted by the unfathomable regard, the unsolved slow cycles to their fount returned to rise again from that invisible sea. To rise again from that invisible sea. All from his puissance born was now undone. Nothing remained the cosmic mind conceived. Eternity prepared to fade and seemed a hue and imposition on the void. Space was the fluttering of a dream that sank before its ending into nothing's deeps. The spirit that dies not, and the Godhead self, seemed myths projected from the unknowable. From it all sprang, in it all is called to cease. But what that was, no thought nor sight could tell. 
only a formless form of self was left. A tenuous ghost of something that had been. The last experience of a lapsing wave before it sinks into a bornless sea. As if it kept even on the brink of naught its bare feeling of the ocean whence it came. A vastness brooded free from sense of space, an everlastingness cut off from time, a strange, sublime, inalterable peace, silent, Rejected from it world and soul. A stark companionless reality. Answered at last to his soul's passionate search. Passionless wordless, absorbed in its fathomless hush, keeping the mystery none would ever pierce. It brooded, inscrutable and intangible, facing him with its dumb, tremendous calm. It had no kinship with the universe. There was no act, no movement in its vast. Life's question met by its silence died on her lips. The world's effort ceased, convicted of ignorance, finding no sanction of supernal light. There was no mind there with its need to know. There was no heart there with its need to love. All person perished in its namelessness. There was no second. It had no partner or peer. Only itself was real to itself. <coughs> A pure existence safe from thought and mood a consciousness of unshared, immortal bliss. <clears throat> it dwelt aloof in its bare infinite, one and unique, unutterably so. A being formless, featureless, and mute that knew itself by its own timeless self, aware forever in its motionless depths, uncreating, uncreated, and unborn, the one by whom all live, who lives by none. An immeasurable, luminous secrecy guarded by the veils of the unmanifest. Above the changing cosmic interlude, abode supreme, immutably the same, a silent cause, occult, impenetrable, infinite, eternal, unthinkable, 
alone. A stillness absolute, incommunicable, meets the sheer self-discovery of the soul. A wall of stillness shuts it from the world. A gulf of stillness swallows up the sense. And makes unreal all that mind has known. All that the laboring senses still would weave prolonging an image unreality. Self's vast spiritual silence occupies space.
Only the inconceivable is left. Only the nameless, without space and time. Abolished is the burdening need of life. Thought falls from us. We cease from joy and grief. The ego is dead. We are freed from being and care. We have done with birth and death and work and fate. O oh soul, it is too early to rejoice. Thou hast reached the boundless silence of the self. Thou hast leaped into a glad divine abyss. But where hast thou thrown self's mission and self's power? On what dead bank on the eternal's road? One was within thee who was self and world. What hast thou done for his purpose in the stars? Escape brings not the victory and the crown. Something thou camest to do from the unknown. But nothing is finished. And the world goes on. Because only half God's cosmic work is done. Only the everlasting no has neared and stared into thy eyes and killed thy heart. <laughs> but where is the lover's everlasting yes? And immortality in the secret heart. 
the voice that chants to the Creator fire. The symboled Om, the great assenting word, the bridge between the rapture and the calm. The passion and the beauty of the bride. The chamber where the glorious enemies kiss. The smile that saves the golden peak of things. This too is truth at the mystic fount of life. A black veil has been lifted. We have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient Lord. But who has lifted up the veil of light? And who has seen the body of the King? The mystery of God's birth and acts remains. Leaving unbroken the last chapter's seal. Unsolved the riddle of the unfinished play. The cosmic player laughs within his mask. And still the last inviolate secret hides behind the human glory of a form, behind the gold eidolon of a name. A large white line has figured as a goal. But far beyond the ineffable sun tracks blaze. What seemed the source and end was a wide gate. A last bare step into eternity. An eye has opened upon timelessness. Infinity takes back the forms it gave. And through God's darkness or His naked light, His million rays return into the sun. There is a zero sign of the Supreme. There is a zero sign of the Supreme. Nature left nude and still uncovers God. But in her grandiose nothingness, all is there.
when her strong garbs are torn away from us. The soul's ignorance is slain, but not the soul. The zero covers an immortal face. A high and blank negation is not all. A huge extinction is not God's last word. Life's ultimate sense. The close of being's course the meaning of this great mysterious world. In absolute silence sleeps an absolute power. Awaking, it can wake the transbound soul. And in the ray reveal the parent sun. It can make the world a vessel of spirit's force. It can fashion in the clay God's perfect shape to free the self is but one radiant pace here to fulfill himself was God's desire Even while he stood on being's naked edge. And all the passion and seeking of his soul faced their extinction in some featureless vast. The presence he yearned for suddenly drew close. across the silence of the ultimate calm. Out of a marvelous transcendence's core, a body of wonder and translucency, as if a sweet mystic summary of herself, escaping into the original bliss, had come enlarged out of eternity, someone came, infinite and absolute, a being of wisdom, power, and delight. Even as a mother draws her child to her arms, took to her breast nature and world and soul, abolishing the signless emptiness, breaking the vacancy and voiceless hush, piercing the limitless unknowable into the liberty of the motionless depths, a beautiful and felicitous luster stole. The power, the light, the bliss, no word can speak, imaged itself in a surprising beam and built a golden passage to his heart, touching through him all longing sentient things. <laughs>